Hi, I'm Katie Friedebach, Chief Medical Officer of Compass Health Network, and I really appreciate your time. Um, we're going to be asking you to look at this video, complete a survey, and then ultimately participate in town hall meetings where you'll have an opportunity to meet with our clinical leaders and ask questions that are important to you and to your family, friends, coworkers, as you kind of figure out how you feel about COVID vaccination. It's particularly important right now that we have these conversations as we observe infection rate, death rate, hospitalization rates increasing um, on this most recent spike. It's impacted many of our communities and um, there's been a lot of discussion around vaccination. So for those of you who are vaccinated, we're asking you to do this so that you can be even more prepared to have courageous conversations with family, friends, and coworkers that help move them towards action as it relates to COVID vaccination. And for those of you who are not vaccinated, it is our sincere hope that through providing some open forum for conversations, you can have um, an opportunity to discuss with some of the experts among our clinical leaders key topics that are important in your decision making process. And there's a lot of information out there about COVID. So I'm going to cover just a couple of things that I think are important foundational areas for us to start the conversation with um, kind of some shared concepts and then use that to kind of spring into these town hall type meetings where you really have um, some some small group discussion about COVID vaccination. So to start with, one of the things I think is particularly important is really helping us recognize how dramatic COVID has been. I've heard in communities folks saying, hey, we get the flu every year and people die of the flu and getting sick and people who are at advanced um, age or who have chronic medical conditions, when they get sick, unfortunately, that's one of the things that we see. They die of pneumonia and influenza. And although that perspective isn't completely wrong, there's elements of it that are really missing what we've seen. And I think this graph um, really helps us understand that every year is true. We do have um, an epidemic of influenza season and it comes up and, and we see unfortunately that a number of people are impacted by that. And we have thousands of people who die of influenza every single year, that much is true. But on the right side of this graph, you see what it looked like influenza, um, COVID, pneumonia deaths through our COVID pandemic. And so it really highlights where we may have a few thousand every flu season die um, per week in a typical flu epidemic. When we experienced our COVID spikes, that looked more like 26,000 people dying in a week of COVID-19. And when you take that and put that in perspective in terms of, at this point, we have a vaccination that would prevent greater than 99% of those deaths, you start to see where we have so much conversation around COVID vaccination. COVID by the numbers has been dramatically impactful to our country. Over 36 million people have been diagnosed with COVID-19, resulting in over 2.5 million hospitalizations and over 600,000 deaths. And among those deaths, over 2,700 deaths have been in children and young adults. Our primary solution, vaccination. Beyond infection control program um, that we have in place, wearing masks, using hand sanitizer, hand washing when appropriately, appropriate, keeping our workstations safe, um, making sure that we are um, keeping our six foot of distancing, all those infection control pieces um, help keep us safe and we know that they work. But our big solution is vaccination. Vaccination is what's going to keep us from continuing to spread this at a very high rate and ultimately um, keep us from developing even more variants, which we're going to talk about. We've had over 411 million doses of these vaccines administered in the US and over 167 million US citizens are fully immunized against COVID. So how do vaccines work? 
It's important for us to consider the way vaccines work as we start to have these conversations. So when you look at different types of pathogens, viruses, bacteria that cause illness, there are um, little subparts called antigens, and that's what our body recognizes and then builds an immune response to or an antibody level that kind of helps our whole immune system recognize when we see it again. And so at the very heart of a vaccine, what we're trying to do is present the body with a little bit of a subpart, an antigen or some information that helps it recognize when you come into contact with that pathogen in the future. We've used vaccines to prevent numerous illnesses and um, COVID-19 is, is no different in what it's trying to accomplish, which is helping our body learn to recognize um, SARS-CoV-2. But our antibodies are part of our antibody, of our immune response. Our immune response is made of a couple of different types of cells. And ultimately, it's the way our bodies spring into action and keep something from progressing and making us even sicker. Primary um, antigen challenge on this slide is kind of science speak for the first time you ever encounter a pathogen. So when you think about little kiddos, they are little um, get sick a little bit easier than um, teenagers and adults because they haven't had exposure to all the different pathogens, viruses, bacteria, things that we get exposed to um, in everyday life. And so their immune system isn't quite as sophisticated. And when you have a primary antigen exposure, COVID-19 is an example of this, something our body hasn't seen before. It takes about seven to 10 days for our body to kind of ramp up. And during that time is when we would typically start to have the symptoms of feeling sick. The next time we get exposed to that, um, that antigen, our body is sophisticated, ready re to respond, and it very quickly sets into motion our immune response coordinated among a couple different cells type, cell types to help protect us from getting advanced um, illness and hospitalization and ultimately death. So what we're really trying to do with vaccines is give our bodies the information our immune system needs to work very effectively without us ever having to get sick. And when you think about the risks involved with COVID and the fact that we've had over 600,000 people die of COVID and we have a vaccine that prevents death greater than 99% of the time, it really starts to become a stark reminder that if those over 600,000 people hadn't had um, to go through that infection, they'd still be alive today. If we could have given them a vaccine and they wouldn't have had that, what we really consider vulnerability. My immune system doesn't recognize this. It doesn't know that it needs to, to rid the body and, and defeat this pathogen. Um, that's really what we're trying to accomplish in vaccination. mRNA vaccines um, work in a very um, targeted way with our own body cells. And so um, there's been a lot of discussion around mRNA um, technology, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the history, but this is showing you how the mRNA um, vaccines work. So you can see at the, the little um, teal circle, there's the little needle going in, and at the top it's showing what happens when you have an mRNA vaccine. The mRNA is taken into the cell, it stays in the cytoplasm, and your body then recognizes that and makes a spike protein. That spike protein is used by your immune system to recognize coronavirus and voila, you're, you're set. You don't have to get sick. Your body's sophisticated. It's ready to help you um, fight the good fight when um, you're exposed to SARS-CoV-2. At the bottom of that circle is an example of what happens if you actually get sick. So your cell takes in coronavirus. Coronavirus kind of hijacks your cells to make more coronavirus. And your immune system starts to recognize, hey, this isn't supposed to be here, and it starts to make an antibody response. And so you kind of get a sense that your body's got a lot of work to do to get sophisticated against fighting infection. And this vaccine just kind of gives it a, a fast track to where you don't have to get sick, but your body's ready. The other thing that has been difficult about mRNA is the confusion between mRNA and DNA. DNA is in our cell nucleus. 
and it is protected by a barrier. So when we have mRNA through a vaccine in our arm, it can't get to our DNA, it can't get into the nucleus. It stays in the outside, the cytoplasm. So when you look at that right picture, it's that kind of teal side. The, the purple color is our nucleus. The mRNA stays in the cytoplasm, and then it does what our cells do with all mRNA. When it's done making protein, it gets rid of that mRNA. When we need proteins for our body, mRNA comes from our nucleus. Um, it's, it's made from our DNA, it's used to make that, and then it comes out into the cytoplasm. And again, it's used to make proteins and it's eliminated. So it can't go the other way. And RNA cannot mix with DNA. And so it's, it's something that we have experience with and that we know is safe, not only from the research that we've done, but also um, our, our own experience with these vaccines. So let's talk a little bit about the history of mRNA, because this is something that I think has led to a lot of discomfort um, in this vaccine type. mRNA is not new technology for us. We've been working with the technology used for these vaccines for over 30 years. And this timeline highlights not only those key milestones that put us in position to have this vaccine so quickly, but also, also the scientists who have dedicated their lives to developing this science. So it all started with really looking at how do we make nanoparticles, a lipid layer that can protect mRNA so that we can use it for treatment. And then you fast forward a little bit further and they're looking at specific ways mRNA could be used to educate our immune system. Interestingly enough, you can see Dr. Corbett here in, um, let's see here, it looks like it was about 2014, started working specifically on how mRNA could be used to help our bodies recognize the spike protein. The spike protein is unique to coronaviruses, but we've seen coronaviruses before. SARS and MERS both caused epidemics, and that's what really inspired Dr. Corbett to start working on how can we use the spike protein to teach our bodies how to recognize coronaviruses so that we don't have another SARS or MERS? And it put us in a great position to develop a vaccine, vaccine that's highly effective for our um, SARS-CoV-2, which is also a coronavirus. The other thing I think is really inspiring is when you think about the way we use 30 years of technology to really inform these vaccines, we also had a, a very high level of focus by these scientists. All the scientists pictured um, at the bottom of the screen were working on other items and they shifted their entire focus over to developing and testing the coronavirus vaccine. So you had scientists that were working on mRNA technology for influenza and Zika, and they shifted it right over. We know that COVID-19 vaccines are safe. We know that because we did clinical studies and enrolled thousands of participants that really were trailblazers in terms of helping us understand how patients might feel when they get this vaccine. We understand what side effects um, folks have experienced. And in large part, it's a little bit of a sore arm. You may have a little bit of redness where you got the shot. It's not too uncommon for people to feel maybe a little achy, might be sick, maybe a little tired. That usually lasts just a couple of days. The majority of people don't have those symptoms. But if you do have those symptoms, it's not unexpected. And quite frankly, we have those types of symptoms with every vaccine we get. Again, think back to those kiddos that get all the vaccines. It's very common for them to ru run a low-grade fever. We give them a little Tylenol and ibuprofen to kind of get through that. That's really the body's reaction and response to a vaccination that would be expected. And so we saw that with COVID. We also saw a couple of other serious side effects that um, were perhaps less expected. Anaphylaxis is one, and that's one that we, we could have um, clearly anticipated, and of course we found it. Anaphylaxis is something that happens um, very rarely in some people. It's a severe allergy reaction. Not only do we have it to vaccines and medicines, but some people have it to foods like peanuts. 
Um, anaphylaxis is something that we recognize and we know how to treat. Um, and it's the main reason why you hang around for 15 minutes after your injection, because we're looking to see if you have any signs or symptoms of anaphylaxis so we can treat it. Two other very rare side effects of COVID vaccination that we discovered. Um, one is TTS, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia um, syndrome, and that occurs about seven per one million doses. And it really highlights the effectiveness of our safety monitoring for these vaccines. We have had the most aggressive safety monitoring system in the history of US vaccine monitoring. And we found this needle in a haystack. When we learned about TTS, you may remember it hit the news. It was it was a hot topic. We actually stopped administering this vaccine so that our scientists could really look at the data. And what they found is no men developed TTS. And this side effect was exclusively um, noted to be higher in women ages 19 to 49. And so um, with that recommendation, we're able to say, hey, we've learned that really if you're a female less than 50, you, you have other options you might consider. This is specific to J&J &J and Janssen. This side effect has not been observed in Pfizer or in Moderna. And so through the safety monitoring, we were able to identify this many months ago, communicate it to doctors and to patients and to help people make informed decisions. Another side effect that we've um, noted is pericarditis and myocarditis risk in children and young adults. This again is a side effect that we have evaluated. Um, we have a specific committee that looks at all the science around these types of side effects and doctors are required to report these types of side effects anytime they're in proximity to a vaccine, a COVID vaccination that's administered. So we are monitoring um, and know a lot about the incidence of this side effect. Myocarditis and pericarditis are inflammation of the heart and the lining of the heart. And the vast majority of folks who develop this recover completely. It's inflammation in response to some trigger. And in this case, it would appear that the risk is slightly elevated um, when you get Pfizer or a Moderna shot. This um, risk is higher in young men um, compared to young women. And um, for a little bit more detail about each and every case and how the risk breaks down, um, you can access the video link that's specific to that topic because it's really important as you consider benefit and, and risk that you get into all the details. So if you have a kiddo that's in this age group and you wanna learn even more about it, there's a great bit of transparency out there and you can hear, um, you can listen to the meetings and you can read all the reports. Um, and um, you know, at the end of the day, when you compare that very rare risk um, less than 60 per million compared to the 2,700 children that have died and over 4,000 children who have had um, um, more serious sequela from COVID-19. That's how we really look at that, that benefit versus risk and um, recognize that although it's a very rare side effect, it is slightly increased in this, this age group, but we expect full recovery and it's a risk we're willing to take to save 2,700 children from losing their lives. And that's, that's really what it comes down to. So ACIP is the committee that really helps us understand when we should provide vaccinations and what the benefit and risk of vaccination are for any given population. And I wanted to talk a little bit about ACIP because it's a committee that really reflects our entire nation. Um, sometimes these recommendations feel very disconnected from what we're seeing in our communities. But in fact, ACIP is a committee with 15 members and two of them are from our backyard. We have an OBGYN that works at KU Health System and we have a vaccinologist who works at St. Louis University. And as you can see in this slide, um, they really represent um, every area of our country and there are numerous um, specialties that are represented and these are all physicians. And so this is a committee that physicians um, are not paid to be a part of. And so when you think about um, your life and the lives of your children, all of the vaccines that you've received have been approved and the recommendations come 
from this um, committee. The FDA approves the vaccination and then ACIP is the committee that approves the schedule or who should get the vaccine and how often they should get it and and sends all of that out. So I have been um, following ACIP recommendations my entire career. Um, your physician has been following them as well. And so when you consider who's recommending this vaccination to you, it is a bunch of physicians that have looked at all the information um, and they're and they're recommending um, the the best um, guidance that they can see to promote your health and well-being. I want to also talk about what's in the vaccine because there are some um, ideas out there that just simply are untrue. The idea that you would have a microchip in, in this um, vaccine is um, absolutely 100% false. Um, we know what are in these vaccines and you can look them up and you can see that they are the same types of things that are in everyday um, things that you ingest and use. Um, really the only thing that's new about this vaccine is the mRNA that helps um, inform your body of how to fight COVID-19. So all the ingredients are here. I encourage you, if this is something that has you concerned, do your research, look at all the ingredients of these vaccines and compare that to other vaccines that you've had or other everyday items that you use. Um, the other thing I would encourage you to do if you're concerned about this, um, come and, and, and talk to our clinical leadership. Um, they'd be happy to show you what a vial looks like. Um, you definitely will get to see the shot before you get that vaccination. So take a look at it. And I think what you'll find is this vaccine is like every other vaccine you've gotten. It's safe and um, effective and the contents of the vaccine are open for you to look at. There's nothing there um, that in any way um, would change the way your arm functions or um, certainly nothing that would help assist with any type of tracking. It's just not true. And, and I suspect you don't think that's true either, but there's just so much of that that's been going around. I want to make sure that, that we address that very, um, very directly. Talking just a little bit about variants, RNA viruses have a tendency to change and they are very um, they are very prone to creating variants. And that's what we're dealing with now in Missouri and across the nation is what's called the Delta variant. You kind of think about the coronavirus as a tree and all these different branches, all these different slight changes. And sometimes a variant really doesn't change the virus at all. Other times it makes it more likely to um, cause severe infection, easier to spread. It may also cause it to be um, harder for us to um, recognize in our tests and harder for us to treat with our therapies. And so variants are really important. And really the only way to stop variants is to reduce the way we spread the virus. Because as long as we're spreading the virus, variation in the way the virus is, is composed is going to happen. And the Delta variant is one that we've been aware of for some time and we've been studying. And the two little bar graphs on the right side of the screen are showing the portion of the Delta variant in our region, um, Kansas, Missouri, and other states in our region, and then also the US on the far right. Um, Delta variant is in the darker bands, so you can see where Delta started out as being a small percentage of our COVID-19 cases, and now it's the vast majority of COVID-19 cases in um, Missouri and then across the nation are Delta variants. Um, Delta variant came, uh, was originally recognized in India, and we know a few things about the Delta variant that help us understand why this is spreading it's much easier to spread and our antibody response to the Delta variant is not is a little reduced compared to previous strains. Um, and our studies have shown that folks that get the vaccination are actually twice as protected against Delta variant as people who have already had COVID-19. So that's an important thing for us to consider and think about as we, can, as we look at these variants is um, will previous infection protect us from getting sick and dying of COVID? And in the case of the Delta variant, previous infection is not gonna protect us 
as much as an immunization will. So it's really important once you recover from COVID-19, you're not having any symptoms, you're out of isolation, you need to get a COVID vaccination because that's what's going to protect you the most. Um, and we know that we are seeing breakthrough infections. And in fact, at Compass, we've seen breakthrough infections too. Folks who got the COVID vaccination and went on to develop COVID-19, um, most likely from the Delta variant. But none of those folks have died of COVID. And when you look at the individuals who have died from Delta variant COVID-19, greater than 99% of them are unvaccinated. Our hospitals, our ERs, they're all filled by folks who are unvaccinated. As President Biden um, mentioned in one of his talks, this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. If you get vaccination, you may still get COVID-19 but you're not gonna get a serious life-threatening illness the vast majority of the time. Greater than 99% of the time, folks that progress and get very severe and die have been unvaccinated. So um, variants are something we'll continue to fight until we get enough vaccination going that we're not spreading COVID um, readily throughout our communities. And this is the way we look at COVID variants. We're looking at specific little elements to help us understand how they may behave. And ultimately, like I said, this is how we stop variants. When you look on the left side, all of that um, population is susceptible. They haven't had a vaccination, they haven't had infection. So when they get exposed to somebody, the little person in the red that has COVID-19, it spreads very easily. On the right side, all those green individuals are protected from infection and protected from infection by vaccination or previous illness. And so when you have one person that has COVID-19 and a group of those individuals, there's not as much chance to spread it and have serious illness. And that's how we, how we, how we fight the variants is we stop the spread. And part of it's through vaccination, vaccination, Although there are breakthrough cases, you're less likely to get infected if you have vaccination. Um, so we, we help through vaccination, but we also help through wearing masks, washing hands, using hand sanitizer, keeping our workspaces safe, and then of course, maintaining six foot of um, social distancing to make sure that if we do have a breakthrough case and someone perhaps is asymptomatic, but they their breakthrough case, they would test positive for COVID-19, that it stays right there and it doesn't spread to everyone around them. Another topic I want to talk about is the idea of COVID vaccination and its impact on fertility and how um, moms who are planning to be pregnant or getting pregnant should think about vaccination. This is a topic that has caused a lot of women a lot of uh, stress as they consider what would be best for, for them and their plans in the future. At the end of the day, ACOG and the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine recommend without hesitation that all individuals considering getting pregnant in the future should get COVID vaccination as soon as possible. We know that when women who are pregnant um, get COVID-19, they have an increased risk of having very severe COVID-19 and our pregnancy outcomes are worse when compared to those who have not had COVID-19. So it's so critically important for your health and the health of children you would have in the future that, that individuals wanting to get pregnant get COVID vaccine as soon as possible. When we started down the process of vaccination, ACOG was um, very forward in saying that pregnant women should have access to COVID vaccination. As of July 30th, 2021, ACOG and the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine both strongly recommend that pregnant women get COVID vaccination because we recognize that they're at increased risk. Initially, it wasn't that there was a concern of any side effect. It was that pregnant moms were not included in clinical trials. So there was just a little bit of a blind spot. But at this point, we have had lots of moms have COVID vaccination safely. And we recognize that getting COVID-19 is a very serious proposition for pregnant moms. And we need to protect moms and babies.
But this has been pretty darn stressful because there's an internet myth that there's a um, sequence of genetic code that's similar between the spike protein of a coronavirus and a placental protein. And there was this myth that there was the potential for you to get confused and for your immune system to attack the placenta. Um, and I've heard a lot of people explain why this doesn't make sense and why scientifically it wouldn't work this way. But one of my favorites actually comes from a, a doc who's at MU who said the idea that our immune system would get confused and attack the placenta thinking that it was a coronavirus spike protein is like thinking that we would get confused um, between an alley cat and an elephant just because they're both gray, that it doesn't make scientific sense. Um, but going even a little bit further than that, there were some scientists at Yale that, that studied over 3,000 human proteins. Among them was this placental protein that started kind of this internet um, conspiracy. And they tested it to see did antibodies that were created in response to COVID vaccination react or falsely identify any of these 3,000 human proteins? And what they found is that it didn't. It didn't get confused on the protein types, that it was specific to the spike protein, including the placental protein that has gotten all this press. So the myth just simply isn't true. Um, and I really hope you'll join me in continuing to combat this myth because not only is it is it dangerous for um, um, women um, not to be vaccinated, but it's particularly dangerous for pregnant women to not be vaccinated against COVID. So we really have to work together to help dispel this myth. But this really highlights the importance of misinformation. Our words have weight and us spreading things that we um, have not confirmed ourselves are um, impactful. We have the ability to promote health and well being. We also have the ability to promote misinformation. So, my request to you is if you've done the research and you have validated information from validated sources, the CDC, ACOG, American Academy of Family Physicians, American Academy of Pediatrics, um, the FDA, share that with your colleagues, friends, share that with folks who are hesitant, help fight the misinformation. If you see information that you're not sure about, hit the pause button, verify that information, and then step into that conversation courageously but respectfully, knowing that there's a lot of fear and misinformation about COVID vaccination, and we have to combat this together. I look forward to talking with you during the town halls. I, um, I hope you'll give COVID vaccination a serious consideration and just kind of support the idea that courage is not the lack of fear. We've gone through a lot this year and there has been a, a lot of change and it's been hard to keep up with the science. And even I, as a family physician, struggle to keep up. Somebody will mention something in a meeting and I'll think, oh, I got to read on that because I didn't see that research article. So we're all um, sprinting at record pace trying to um, to support health and well-being in our friends, families, and communities. But courage is not the absence of fear and uncertainty. It is acting in spite of it. So I'm asking you to act in spite of your hesitation, to act in spite of your fear. Dig into this conversation. Ask our clin clinical leaders the questions that you have. And, and please get the COVID vaccination. I have um, four children. My mom's 77. Everybody in our household is vaccinated. Um, and, and I'm so thankful um, that we're in that position, that we can all be together. And although my kiddos are grow going back to school and I recognize that, that any one of us could get um, a breakthrough infection with COVID-19, we'll do what we can. But that vaccination is really a shield, making sure that if we do get COVID-19, Nine, over 99% of the time, it is not going to result in the death of um, somebody that we we love and that that we care about. One of one of the folks on this um, on this picture. So I look forward to talking to you and thank you so much for your time.